So in this video, we're going to talk about the importance of information and some of the problems we encounter with respect to information when we are engaged in economic activity. Um, so if you're following the study guide, um, you know, why is information so important? Well, obviously, you know, as consumers, as business people, as voters, um, in, our, in, our, in the different activities in which we engage, uh, we like to think that we have all of the information necessary to make the best decision possible. And remember, economics is all about making decisions uh, in the face of scarcity. You know, if we don't have good information, then we may not make an optimal choice about how we use our scarce resources. Um, if we don't necessarily have all the information, we may not plan our day to the best of our ability, or uh, we may not, um, you know, engage in the right uh, activity at work that is going to get the job done. Um, if we're voters, you know, are we really going to pick the candidate that's going to, uh, you know, be the best uh, candidate for society or that most matches, you know, what we want out of a candidate? So information is crucial to economic agents being able to act in their own rational self-interest. So remember we said, uh, you know, person, a firm, a society, we're all we're assuming that they all act rationally, which means there's some logical thought process uh, behind their decisions. So when we don't have all information, um, you know, the question is, well, then are we still acting rationally? And it might seem like well, the obvious answer is no. You know, if there's more information, then you would obviously be able to make a better choice. And if you'd still make the bad choice, you know, then you're being irrational. So in economics, what we say is that people aren't acting uh, with complete, perfect information. They're not being necessarily perfectly rational. Um, in other words, um, or what we say is that they're doing the best they can. And so we say that economic agents act um, under what we call bounded rationality. So there's limits to how much we know. At any point in time, we're simply going to make the best choice possible given that information that we have at that time. Now, when we think about efficiency, you know, efficient outcomes in terms of productive efficiency, you know, are we producing a product using the least costly combination of resources, or allocative efficiency, are we allocating resources to make the right mix of goods and services? Obviously, if we as consumers, producers, and a society uh, lack certain information, then we may not necessarily have the most productively uh, efficient way to make a product, or we may be misallocating resources. So we may be sending too many resources to make widgets and not enough resources to make gizmos, and that means we aren't achieving an allocatively efficient outcome. Now, um, the problems we're getting into. Uh, generally speaking, um, in addition to just not having, you know, all information, uh, in some cases, uh, when there's two economic agents uh, engaged in some transaction or activity, uh, there may be asymmetric information. And asymmetric simply means uneven. So, um, perfect example, you go to buy a used car, right? Um, you, as the buyer, you can inspect the car, you can listen to what the car seller tells you, uh, but there, you're never going to have all of the information that that car seller has. And it may be, you know, they're intentionally hiding some information, or maybe there's just little bits of information, you know, you don't think to tell someone that you're trying to sell a car to. But that car seller obviously has more information about the car than you do. And so the question is, you know, given that asymmetry, um, are you, the buyer, necessarily going to make the best decision when it comes time to buy the car? All right. Uh, now that is an example of asymmetric information that we call adverse selection. And so this is a type of problem we run into before you know, two agents actually make the transaction. So before the car buyer and seller actually shake hands and seal the deal, um, we have adverse selection because that buyer um, is trying to make sure that they don't make a bad selection, right? Uh, they're trying to make sure that they don't buy the car thinking it's of higher quality than it actually is. Um, another example would be um, an employer trying to hire a worker. Um, obviously that worker knows everything about themselves pretty much and they're going to try and present you know themselves as the best person for the job uh, but there may be certain things about them that you know they know don't make them the best person but they're not necessarily going to share that with the employer and so that's up to the employer then to try and make sure they pick the best employee which is obviously going to be tricky if uh, the, the applicants are withholding information. So when it comes to adverse selection, you know, what we want to try to do is make sure that uh, both parties have access to all of the information. So when it comes to buying used cars, uh, one, uh, one method of ensuring uh, better information is something like Carfax. So when you buy a car or you're thinking about buying a car, you can write down the VIN, plug it in, and you can see a history of, you know, the, the accidents and the repairs and, and everything about that particular car, assuming it's all been reported. Um, so 
there are tools we can use to provide people with better information. Um, with respect to the, the used car, we have actual laws in place that say if you sell someone a car and you know there's something wrong with it, um, and the and the buyer determines that there that there's this problem and that you withheld the information, then they can get their money back. This is what we refer to as the lemon laws. A lemon is just you know a bad car, um, and so we uh, provide you know a solution for someone who has made a decision based on you know faulty or uh, misleading information. With respect to the job, um, you know the, the the firm trying to hire a worker. Um, you know how many times have you been to a job interview and you had to take a little written test or a typing test? or they want to see you know a recommendation or uh, a transcript from college right these are all things that an employer uh, can require an applicant to share that gives the employer more information and allows them to make a better pick now another type of problem we run into is uh, moral hazard and this is still a form of asymmetric information and the best example of this um, is um, insurance so there's already an adverse selection problem when it comes to an insurance company insuring individuals, right? So if I'm a sick individual and I know that I'm going to be, you know, using up a lot of insurance, healthcare payments, um, I may not necessarily want to share that with the insurance company because if they know that I'm a high risk individual, that I'm going to incur a lot of expenses, they don't necessarily want to insure me because, you know, I'm going to be paying them a monthly premium just like everybody else, but then they're going to have to be paying a lot for my medical care. So there's that adverse selection problem. Uh, but then on top of that, let's say that I do get insurance, right? And let's say I'm not a high-risk person. Uh, but now that I have insurance, I know I have information that says if something bad happens to me, I'm going to get, you know, health care. I'm going to have someone that will, you know, help pay for my, my medical care. And so what that may do is actually change my behavior going forward. So that new information, knowing that I'm protected, you know, if something happens to me, may actually change my behavior such that I become a high-risk individual. And so maybe with health insurance, you know, I decide, you know what, I'm going to take up skateboarding, right? I never wanted to do it before because I knew if I got hurt, I'd have to pay for it. But now that I've, you know, gotten health insurance, that changes my behavior. I go out, I start skateboarding without a helmet, without pads, and I know that if I get busted up, the health insurance company, you know, is going to pay for my health care. Now, um, how can we address that problem? Um, obviously, you know, um, up until recently, healthcare companies uh, could drop you. Um, if you sign up for healthcare coverage and they decided that you had a pre existing condition, right, the, the law allowed the health insurance company to terminate that, that transaction, that relationship, that contract. Um, obviously, there are other concerns with you know doing that, and so that practice has been um, um, barred or, or banned. Uh, but you know, a health insurance company may be able to write things into their contract that say, okay, we agree to insure you, right? We agree to help you pay for your healthcare costs unless you go out and do something intentionally, right? So if you go out and engage in risky behavior, there may be you know clauses in the insurance that say, well, we're not going to you know pay for certain accidents. So when the stars of Jackass go out and do their crazy stunts and get hurt, their insurance companies have probably written to the contract saying, if you do something to hurt yourself intentionally, even if it's for laughs, we're not going to cover you, all right? Now, a unique uh, problem we run into is what we call the principal agent problem. And this kind of, again, combines both the adverse selection and the moral hazard. And so a principal is someone who needs a task done. And the agent is the person that they actually hire or charge with carrying out that task. And so a great example of this is the shareholders, uh, the board of directors of a company, of a firm. Uh, they need someone to come in and run the firm day to day, right? If you're a shareholder, you don't want to have to go into the office and make all the decisions and pay the employees and do all that boring stuff. You just want to invest in the company and then have someone else run it and then you earn money. So the principals, uh, the shareholders in this case, will hire an agent and that person is the, the CEO. They're the ones that are going to be hired and, and be tasked with the daily responsibilities of running the company. So first off, there's that adverse selection problem where the board of directors, the shareholders, first has to select a CEO. So that means they've got to gather all of the information about all of the potential CEOs so that they can pick the best person to, to do the job. But then after that, uh, what we're going to run into is uh, what we call a possible misalignment of incentives. And this occurs because the shareholders at the end of the day, right, they want the company to be run well, they want the company to be successful so that they can earn interest and dividends on their investment. So that's their incentive. They just want the company to succeed. Well, the CEO, depending on, you know, what the terms of their employment are, 
uh, may not be worried about anything other than just showing up and collecting a paycheck, right? Uh, what's going to guarantee that that person is actually going to show up to work and actually work? And so we have this moral hazard problem. So if we just sign a contract with the CEO and say, all right, here are the keys, you show up, you make the choices, well, what's to guarantee that they're actually going to make choices that also are good for the company, that are good for the shareholders? So the CEO just wants to show up and get paid. The shareholders, they want the company to grow, to earn dividends. Those aren't necessarily the same thing. And so we have a misalignment of incentives. Now, how can we address that problem? Um, well, first off, we could just monitor, right? Um, maybe we could pop in every now and then and say, hey, what are you doing? Or maybe we install cameras or we hire a detective to follow them around or something, right? Um, so we monitor them. Uh, the problem is that it's going to cost more money to monitoring. It's either going to mean that we have to come in and monitor them, which if we're monitoring and showing up every day, why don't we just run the business, right? Why pay this person? Or if we're going to install cameras or surveillance equipment or whatever, um, that's all going to cost money. So that might not be the best solution. So what we might want to do instead is see if we can actually realign the incentives so that we make sure that the CEO is um, trying to achieve the same thing that the shareholders want to achieve. So we can do this with contracts. So when we hire the CEO, assuming we've gotten over that adverse selection problem, assuming we've got the best candidate, before we hand the keys over right, and uh, give them the corner office, uh, what we do is we write into the contract uh, certain things that they have to accomplish. So, you know, maybe how many hours a week they have to work or, um, you know, deadlines for getting certain projects done. Or maybe, you know, we tie their paycheck to the success of the company. Maybe we say, all right, well, we're going to give you a base paycheck, right? Um, some base level of pay. But if you want to earn more money than that, then there are certain milestones, um, certain quotas that you have to meet. Um, in order to achieve a higher uh, compensation. Or maybe we turn the CEO into a shareholder. We say, all right, we're going to pay you a salary to come in and do the job every day. But on top of that, we will sign over a certain number of shares to you, which means that the person that's coming in and running the show every day is now also going to be a shareholder, which means they are going to certainly do everything they can to maximize their shares. Now, the problem we're into here is that what if the CEO comes in makes a lot of decisions that earn a lot of money, and then says, okay, I'm done, sells their shares when the company's doing really well, they earn a big you know, uh, corporate or capital gains, and then they, they rot off into the sunset, and then the next day someone shows up and says, hey, you know, they made the decisions yesterday, they earned the company a lot of money, uh, but now there are some new things happening, and maybe the sum of decisions they made yesterday um, they paid off in the short run, but they're going to cause problems in the future, and maybe the company won't be as successful in the future. Well, obviously now, again, we have a misalignment of incentives. Uh, the shareholders, they're trying to make sure that the company is successful into the long run, that it's going to be successful over a long period of time, whereas the shareholder showed up, boosted sales, boosted business, cashed out, and then got the heck out of Dodge. And so what you see, again, is in the contract saying, okay, we're going to make you a shareholder so that you are, you know, you've got skin in the game. You're going to be after the same thing we are. But to make sure that you don't just, you know, run the shares up and boost short-term profits, we're going to say that, yeah, you have these shares, but you can't sell them until some period in the future, right? We've got to make sure that the minute you walk out the door, right, and retire or quit, that you're not just going to cash out, that you're still going to have skin in the game because if we say that you can't cash your shares out until in the future, that means that you're going to be forced to make decisions today that are going to benefit the company uh, much further into the long run. So there are all sorts of problems we run into with respect to information. Uh, we talked about how in perfect competition, you know, we assume that every agent, every actor in the, in the market has perfect information. Um, we like to assume that individuals are being perfectly rational, but we know that's not possible. Um, we do the best we can. We operate under bounded rationality, and beyond that, we simply do whatever we can to gather as much information as possible so that we can ultimately make the best choice.